Hi, I'm Steve Lando, tax leader of Anshin's Law Firm Services Group. With me today is Deb DeVries, our assurance partner extraordinaire of the group and co-leader of our firm's compensation and benefits practice. Today, Deb and I are going to discuss law firm economics, particularly cash capital, a very important topic for law firm partners as well as shareholders. So Deb, while all law firms may be created equal from a cash capital point of view, are some firms more equal than others? Actually, yes, they are. Cash capital requirements often depend on the type of firm and the firm's cash needs. So when we're talking about different types of firms, we're talking about general practice firms versus a litigation boutique versus a class action firm, and they all have different cash needs. So can you talk about how cash capital might be different for each type of firm? Sure. Well, first take a general practice firm that, you know, they have different practice areas and firms such as these may only need one month, one month of mm -hmm. cash for expenses to be kept in cash capital at all times. Then you move on to a litigation practice. They might need one, two or three or even more months to fund both operating expenses and potential outlay of hard costs. Mm -hmm. And then on the other extreme, we have a class action firm and they might need three to six months or more of cash. And that's really due to the large nature of the hard costs and then the contingent nature of the ultimate receipt of the outlay of those costs, along with the collection of the related fees. So that's quite the disparity in cash to be kept on hand. How do firms manage their cash, especially in the litigation realm? So every firm is different. For example, a non-contingent litigation firm, they might pre-bill their hard costs and not even pay the third-party vendor until they collect the pre-bill costs from their client. And this is something that we've actually seen more and more over the past decade, mm -hmm. where even with general practice firms, they don't want to act as a bank for their clients. But then when you look at the litigation firms, particularly those that operate on a contingent basis, they might use bank financing, such as lines of credit to fund the hard costs. And then other firms uh, might even consider taking in litigation funding. Um, but the issue with that could be there's a large trade-off because it's very expensive to do so and might really take away from the ultimate fee they might receive. So Deb, is it possible for a firm to have too much or alternatively too little cash capital? Of course, and we do see that with prospects often. Okay, so I can see the downside to too little cash, mm -hmm. but where's the downside of too much cash? So if you have too much cash, the first thing is it's exposed to litigation because that cash is an asset of the firm. But more importantly, it means you're not getting cash out to the partners or the shareholders. And of course, to them, cash is king. So here we are, we're in an environment still, the great resignation during COVID, and everyone thinks the grass is greener on the other side. So it's super important to keep partners happy with cash distributions more so now than ever. And then whether or not a firm is over or undercapitalized, we always sit down, we work with the executive committee along with the finance team to really reevaluate their needs for these purposes. And we can also provide thoughts on other financing alternatives. But just keep in mind, every firm is different psychologically and some are acutely debt adverse. So it's really about what's right for that particular firm. So what about funding partner shortfalls? Like for instance, firms that you've got partners keeping in excess capital and the firm may pay interest on that capital. Right, so that happens as well. But in reality, partners should bear their proportionate share of cash capital without the need for excess contributions by just some partners. At the end of the day, the interest that's paid on the excess capital, it ends up being an allocation of profits. And where we really do see this more often is when there are multiple classes of partners and only equity partners have capital. And the end result of that is really a reduction of distributable profits to the non-equities by using that methodology. Got it. All right. Thanks, Deb. That was great. We'd like to thank everyone for tuning in to our vlog today. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either Deb, myself, or your ancient relationship partner. So until next time.